And I, I wish to thank you very much, Dr. Farinas, and also for the hospitality of the university here. And it's my first time in Brazil, and it's a wonderful trip. So um, I'm very glad to be here. I'll talk a little bit about our cellulose research, but I feel a bit awkward because the cellulose research in the biofuels area is really done in Brazil. Brazil is a leader. But hopefully today, and also at CINAFER, I will be able to communicate more, and I'll be able to learn a little bit more about what's going on in Brazil. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, my host and hostess, and also um, uh, the work I'll report today has been supported by a number of different uh, government agencies and uh, industry. Uh, I'd like to give you just a few minutes of background on cellulosic ethanol, um, particularly in the United States, and the viewpoint of the National Academies, that's the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, that was requested by the U.S. government um, to basically look at the future of cellulosic ethanol between uh, now and 2035. And there's a lot of issues, uh, both technical and other issues, that need to be addressed. And so this report attempted to put the uh, various factors together and take an international view of biofuels and renewable resources. And um, the, the book is online. It was published in 2009. It's called America's Energy Future. And basically, uh, the report, which is probably 600 pages came up with three, at least I believe, three major conclusions. And the issues really are environmental, and really the burning of fossil fuels, which continues even now, really does not consider many of the factors that impact the climate and other issues long term. And that's a very important area. Uh, second of all, national security, and this could be in Brazil, in the Americas, in the US, uh, there's falling production of petroleum, and granted, for instance, there is the frac oil, the frac gas, but long term, relative to the demand, the amount of fossil fuels that are being produced are uh, decreasing. And so, as a consequence, uh, there's not only issues with transportation fuel, but also with electrical sector as well, which is addressed, interestingly enough, by some of the co-production of electricity being done in Brazil and some of the plants. Last but not least, there's the economic competitiveness, and that is the prices of uh, energy, uh, resources to make energy, is really highly volatile. And it's very difficult for businesses to plan ahead 10, 20 years, which is what it costs to build a plant and to pay it back. It's very difficult for the uh, industry to plan ahead. And this has a huge effect on the economy of, of national, uh, national economies. So basically, there are different types and sources of biomass. The other thing the report looked at, in order to have a sustainable industry, one in which investments can be made long term, the feedstocks for these industries must also be assured. Otherwise, again, it's very, very risky. And depending on the region here in the Americas, Americas being North America, South America, Central America, it really depends where um, the plant would be located. In the US, in the Midwest, it might be corn stove, corn stalks, uh, wood. Here in Brazil, obviously, it might be the, the green leaves that are left over. They call it trash, but I don't think it is. Um, but the green leaves that are left over after they uh, be taken off the plant before the sugar cane is harvested. Some of the, bad, the gas, but much of it is already used to generate electricity. Um, and so there are other types of biomass materials. And the other thing the report looked at very briefly was, in fact, biomass sources in Africa. Because there the infrastructure is not yet completely developed, and so there are some opportunities to bring in new technology. So one of the things that's very important, and I'm taking the example from the US, is there are large economies of scale that come with fuel ethanol plants. The challenge, however, is to site, to locate these plants in areas where there is enough biomass in order to supply the need of the facility to produce the ethanol. So in the U.S., there are only 17 locations that would be able to sustainably produce 
or utilize 7,000 tons per day of, uh, in this case, woody or cellulosic material. Most of the plants will be smaller, mainly because we can only transport the biomass short distances, perhaps 50 to 100 kilometers. And so most of the plants that one would, would design will be in this range. So that means there are limits to how big the plants can be, and to Professor Whitley's point, that also means that process intensification is going to be absolutely critical for the economic success of the industry. And I think the, whole, the same thing is true here in Brazil. You can only ship sugarcane a certain distance before it becomes uneconomic. And that then limits the size of your plant. In the U.S., uh, much of the biomass is located It's okay. In the U.S., uh, it's most, of it. most of it's located in the middle of the country, and this is where there's a lot of rainfall. And the red is the largest, uh, the highest intensity. And that turns out that this is where trees have been planted when they used to do strip mining of coal. And they covered up the coal mines with dirt when they were exhausted. They planted trees, and so there's a lot of biomass actually being generated. And so the biomass available in the U.S., um, probably about 500 million tons a year, sustainably. And that's enough for 30, if, they, if we converted all of it to fuel ethanol, that's enough for 30% of the consumption of liquid fuel gasoline in the U.S. And so there's a lot of uh, possibilities there. And most of it is associated with growth of agricultural crops, hay, corn, and wheat. Now, the other thing to look at is the amount of yield of ethanol that is possible, the maximum practical yield. This is approximately about uh, 0.35 to 0.4 tons of uh, ethanol per metric ton of biomass. So again, uh, that means there's some material left over the lignin, and this must be somehow utilized and can be utilized economically and the, the current economic models are to utilize this material for the production of electricity. So if this is done, then the net carbon footprint of these plants is basically zero because there's more than enough lignin present in order to generate the power required to convert the remaining material into biofuel. So the other attractiveness here is, is that the carbon footprint is basically zero. It's carbon neutral, which is very important in long term. Now in Brazil, uh, the sugarcane industry, and I looked this up on the map, this is right here, right? So I'm making most of it. And I've got some of the, the uh, information from Goldenberg, and he's published a lot about uh, ethanol in Brazil, and it's very well known in the United States. And, and one thing to note is that I know that every once in a while one reads uh, newspaper articles about sugarcane and Brazil and the Amazon. And what struck me is there's several thousand kilometers between the two. But I think the detail, I guess. So. Yeah. So there's some interesting analogies uh, on the left of the sugarcane thing. So anyhow, um, those, this is the important part. So on the left is the sugarcane plant. And actually, it's uh, similar to the corn plant, corn stalk, um, in the sense that it has the stalk, the leaves, and the yields of uh, biomass per acre actually are very similar, if, if you look at the, the green trash. Now, the total biomass generated by sugarcane is about double, two and a half times that of corn. But the cellulosic portion is very similar. And indeed, the properties of processing are also similar. And my friends in uh, agronomy tell me that the two plants are actually related. Also, it's interesting, I, I got two pictures. The way the corn residues are being, uh, they're testing new machines for harvesting in the US. And here you can see a machine that's harvesting both the corn, the grain, and the stalk. And I was struck by the similarity to a sugarcane harvesting system being used in Brazil. So again, there's a lot of similarities on the collection. 
In the U.S., a company by the name of Poet has done studies on how to harvest, market, buy, and then store corn stover. And so they set up a system where they're buying a corn stalks at the top from the farmers. And basically what they do is they look at the composition and the moisture. And if the moisture is too high, the composition is too low, they won't buy it. And then if there is uh, a difference in the composition of the moisture, they will then determine the price based on how the corn stalks have been stored. And the system really will look at using corn stalks and corn stover by having the farmer store it locally and then provide it to the plant. So basically it puts the risk of the feedstock onto the growers, which is, which is an interesting strategy. Again, very similar to the sugar mill model here in Brazil. This is from uh, a publication from Unica in 2010, and what they described was uh, the use of sugar for sugar production, production of ethanol, and the use of the cellulosic or the gas portion in some straw to make more ethanol, the remainder of it being uh, used for generation of electricity. I will talk about the, uh, the where it says one third the gas. The rest of today's uh, presentation will talk about how to handle the gas and some of the processing technologies that we've examined. We'll also address uh, uh, John's talk with respect to how one would carry out process intensification and some of the limitations that we must overcome to make ethanol production economic. So a classical cellulose to ethanol plant, and they all look very similar from the point of view of the key unit operations going from left to right, are feedstock preparation, cutting in the biomass into small enough pieces so it can go through the plant. The second step is pretreatment, and that is to soften the biomass the stalk, the sugarcane material, so that it can be more readily hydrolyzed, attacked by the enzymes, and then converted to ethanol. After that, there's hydrolysis and fermentation. Some processes will do hydrolysis separate from the fermentation. Others will combine them. Some processes now actually use microorganisms to secrete enzymes and at the same time ferment the sugar to ethanol. Then, of course, there's the separations, uh, including distillation. And then the material that is left over is used for what we call combined heat and power to generate the energy both to run the plant with additional electricity being then sold to the grid. And this process is very efficient. It's almost carbon neutral, but it's very expensive capital-wise. And so part of the challenge we have as engineers is to reduce these costs. So pretreatment is very important. It's at the front end of the process, and if it's done properly, it reduces the amount of enzyme, it, re it improves the efficiency. And there really are some other issues, however. Even though it makes the substrate accessible more reactive, it also releases inhibitors. We have found in our research um, that the inhibitors, okay, so basically it reduces enzyme usage, but it also releases enzyme inhibitors. And these include sacarides, which are very inhibitory of cellulases, phenols from the lignin, tannic acids. The tannic acids we found actually precipitate the cellulase. So the reason that some of the processes use so much enzyme is they're titrating the tannic acid with cellulase enzyme, which doesn't make a lot of sense but that's what's happened, except if you're a, a cell of enzyme, I guess. But anyhow, so, so, so basically, at the same time, it also forms fermentation inhibitors. Acetic acid comes with the biomass material, so that has to be removed. And then there are aldehydes, <coughs> although pretreatment processes now can be uh, operated to minimize formation of aldehydes. So although pretreatment enhances the reactivity, it also generates inhibitors that interfere with the economics of the process. And I'll talk more about the, the, some of the elements that seem it from uh, later this week. Now, the pretreatment itself, the whole idea, 
is to take, this is a cartoon, this is lignin, the cellulose is crystalline, and the hemicellulose is entrapped between the cellulose polymer. The pretreatment opens up the structure, it opens up the lignin, it disrupts the cellulosic part, and then also dissolves out the hemicellulose. So it makes the structure at a molecular level much more open. So, um, I've worked on many different types of pretreatment systems. Uh, the one that, however, appears to be the most economic at this point is liquid hot water pretreatment. And it's similar to steam explosion, but there are some very important differences. Both uh, steam explosion, which is used in Brazil, I believe, and liquid hot water use water. Steam explosion may add acid. And that would seem to improve matters. The enzyme is more active. The reason is the acid hydrolyzes the xylulosaccharides, which is an inhibitor of the enzyme. The problem is the acid also forms perforate, which is an inhibitor of the yeast. So you get one benefit and one, one uh, disadvantage. And then the particle size reduction is uh, done through explosive decompression. So it's harder to recover the energy of pretreatment. Liquid hot water um, is carried out under pressure. So you heat it up, you cool it down, but it's under pressure, so the water is always in liquid form. The pH is at 4 to 7. And that's something that we found after many years of study, that if we keep it in this range, we minimize degradation. So then what we did is we added a lot of buffer to keep the pH range in that range. And that's too expensive, it doesn't work. Finally, we found out that the gas, corn stover, and certain types of biomass are self-buffering to this pH range. So as a consequence, by adding, if you have a high enough concentration of these solid materials, you're able then to keep the pH in the right range. Um, no chemicals are added. And if temperatures between 160 and 215 degrees C, you get a reactive substrate. So the philosophy behind uh, doing the pretreatment is to avoid this sort of reaction. If, if one has uh, pretreatment, particularly true if you add small amounts of acid, the cellulose is converted into something that's more reactive. That then forms an intermediate, which then goes to glucose and almost immediately forms degradation products, formic acid, perforal, hydroxymethylferferol, labulinic acid. And these acids, in turn, self-catalyze further destruction of the cellulose. And even if this is small, 5 or 10 or 15 percent, the inhibitors themselves significantly interfere with the action of the enzymes and with the fermentation, so they have to be removed. So what's been done is overlining has been used to do this. But now chemicals are being added. They have to be removed, and the economics no longer work because the margins between processing condition and product value is so small. Okay? And so the whole idea is can we avoid, for starters, degradation products and still get a good pretreatment? Well, it turns out it's not as easy as it looks because if you have liquid water and you heat it up, it has a dissociation constant. And so as a consequence, it acts as an acid. So between, starting around 160 to 170, certainly at 200 degrees centigrade, which is a pretreatment temperature, the water acts as an acid and causes this reaction anyhow. And once you form the organic acid, it's self-catalytic, the so-called autohydrolysis. And what we want to do is avoid this. So the idea is that the autohydrolysis itself during pretreatment will follow the path of least resistance. Well, the whole idea of pretreatment is to get a reactive cellulose so that when you add enzyme, it forms sugar. Well, the real problem is at very high temperature, once you form this, this is also very reactive, will form oligosaccharides and then glucose, and you want to stop it at that point. So the whole idea with liquid hot water pretreatment is to identify a narrow range of conditions where you control the reaction, where you minimize hydrolysis, 
maximize the opening of the structure, and then allow biotechnology to take that feedstock and do the final conversion step. So what liquid hot water pretreatment does by controlling the pH, concentration of solids between 150 and 250 grams per liter, 15 to 25 percent, is it maximizes this part of the reaction, which is really a physical change. It's not so much a chemical change. And then at lower temperature, 50 degrees C or lower, using enzymes, some of this will remain, okay, but most of the cellulose will be in this form. You use the selectivity of the enzyme to go to glucose and minimize degradation problems. So this worked great when we used purified cellulose, but as soon as we moved to corn stover, we found that the enzymes did not appear to have the activity. Which, by the way, um, your student is finding out as well <laughs> with the steam exploited material. We'll get to that story in a minute. Um, and so what we really have to do is separate the pretreatment from the hydrolysis, avoid degradation products, but also recognize the importance of two things. One, are we able to liquefy the material? And two, what do we do with the inhibitors? Now, the fact that there are inhibitors present should not surprise you. I mean, if you look at that. <laughs> so. so this is corn stove, not big, big ass. But this is the way it looks when it comes off the field. This is what it looks like after pretreatment. It's a dark, it's like, like a humus. And then what happens is we use a very small amount of enzyme. Um, and again, we've probably some work on this, but basically, if you use an enzyme that comes endogluconase, it does a very good job, very small amounts of exogluconase, and that then liquefies the material within a half hour. Very small amount. And once you have it liquefied, you don't have a lot of sugar present, it's very easy to stir it and ferment it. And it's quite horrible. Okay, so this is the same solids content, all three of these. So it just shows you that after pretreatment, you can in fact liquefy the material. And then there's something that we've now processed. We can design the reactor around. It's very important. And so the other thing we did is we scaled up our, uh, our pretreatment and we took a machine to the field. So we built this in our shop in, in agriculture and biological engineering. This is a pretreatment to the steam generator. This is where you feed the material in. And we were able to run it. We set it up so it can run off of a, um, a portable generator, diesel generator. Not because it was economic, but we had to take it to the field. We wanted to get large quantities of material to do further study. So I like this slide because it describes now some of the challenges. You use this machine, you get a liquefied corn stover, and it still doesn't work very well unless you recognize some key issues. This slide is from Nova, one of their uh, presentations at one of their websites. But basically, it discusses the different types of pretreatment, acid, neutral, and alkaline. The blue line is a degree of inhibition of the yeast. So with acid pretreatment, the yeast, which can ferment either C5 or C6 to ethanol, is the greatest. And as the pH increases, the inhibition of the yeast gets less, decreases. The reason is, at acid pH, you form all these aldehydes, hydroxymethyl furfural, furfural, and these are very acetic acid, and these are very inhibitory to yeast. So unless you remove these inhibitors, it doesn't work well. On the other hand, as you increase the pH, acid, neutral, alkaline, the degree of inhibition of the enzyme increases. There's different mechanisms. The acid pretreatment has the lowest inhibition the enzyme because the xyloligosaccharide, the xylam is hydrolyzed to xylose. Okay? As you go to neutral pH, the xyloligosaccharides are not hydrolyzed, which is the whole idea here. And that means that the cellulase enzyme is inhibited by the xyloligosaccharides. 
And as you increase it even further at alkaline conditions, very little hydrolysis occurs and other inhibitors are released, phenolics in, in particular, that literally precipitate out the enzymes. So we'd like to think the optimum somewhere here and by being able to utilize some of our enzyme technology to hydrolyze megasaccharides and modify the phenolics, we might be able to minimize the inhibition of the enzymes. So you might say, what are the sources of inhibitors? There's heavy cellulose, cellulose and lignin. The lignin forms phenolic compounds. Ethanol is an inhibitor, but that's really, you know, there's many yeasts now that are at, at, at the conditions used for cellulose. Um, there are many yeasts that are resistant to ethanol. It's furfural. That's a degradation product. There's hydroxymethyl furfural, and really at pre-treat conditions, particularly steam explosion, liquid hot water, there's very little HMF form if the pH is close to between four and seven. So the question then is, is how do we identify what the inhibitors were? And I'll give you a very brief overview. Uh, basically, we take the pre-treated biomass, we add water, we separate it into solids and filtrate, we evaporate, liquid, we have a concentrate, which we then identify <coughs> using liquid chromatography and mass spectroscopy to identify the components that are present. Um, we may use malic acid or other uh, acids to hydrolyze the oligosaccharides and xylose. If we use XAD or activated carbon, we can remove some of these inhibitors. By doing this and then comparing at each step the impact on enzyme activity, we're able to determine which inhibitors are interfering with the enzymes. So this slide it, it was recently published in uh, Enzyme Microbial Technology. Sort of gives an idea. Now this is a very interesting slide. The concentration of enzyme is two milligrams per gram glucan, which is roughly about between 0.5 and 1 milligram per gram total solids, which is one-tenth of the industrially published conditions. And so you might say, how did we do this? Well, this experiment, what we did is we pre-treated the corn stover, removed the solids, and added back sulfur flock, not pre-treated, but just added back cellulose to make the point. And then what happened is we looked at the effect of different inhibitors. So the lowest conversion, this is 72 hours hydrolysis, is when the xyligomers are present. If we remove the xyligomers, we get a little bit higher conversion. That's the red line, but the phenolics are still present. If we remove the phenolics by activated carbon, we get a higher conversion. We're now about 70%. If we have only the xylose present, we get about 80%. So this says there's some other inhibitors. It turns out there's other types of phenolics and tannic acids. So if we remove all the inhibitors, we can get close to 100% conversion. It turns out we use sulfoflock because it has a very low lignin content. And the difference between here and here is due to the lignin because lignin non-selectively absorbs the cellulase enzymes. So some of the structures of the inhibitors are malamine, syringe aldehyde, transdynamic acid, and 4-hydroxybenzoic acid. This shows the extent of inhibition. 4 is higher than 3, is higher than 2 is 1. And what we see is, depending on the source of the enzyme, this is trichoderma, this is aspergillus, will depend on the type of inhibition we see. So the inhibition is not only a function of the inhibitors and of the biomass, it's also a function of the protein structure, therefore the source, of the, the microbial source of the enzyme. So different biomass materials will have different optima. 
And this is a really interesting slide. This is the effect of phenolic compounds on filter paper activity. And this was actually discovered by Eduardo Hermanis, who works in our lab. Um, and basically what this is, the inhibition of FPA's filter paper activity by phenolic compounds. Filter paper activity is the combined activity of the enzymes. Um, that be the endo, the exo, the beta glucose, the ACE. <clears throat> what happens in the presence of very small tannic acid that is naturally present, this is in corn stover, 60% of the activity is inhibited. So, what do you do? You add more enzyme. It's very ineffective. <clears throat> Compared to these other um, components, which are also inhibitors, tannic acid is the majority of the problem. Now, gallic acid, ferulic acid, cumeric, and synaptic acid are also significant inhibitors of enzyme activity. So, if you had to have an economic decision, the first thing to do is remove the tannic acid. Something else that's interesting, and this is, a, again, roughly the ratio of, uh, at the enzyme levels we use, the ratio of the enzyme protein to the presence of the phenolics. The phenolics are present in very small amounts, but the protein that we want to use for an economic process is even smaller. Okay, and so this is an inhibition of basically uh, beta glucosidase activity, and here's two Forms. One is from Aspergillus, the other is from Trichoderma. What you can see is the inhibition of beta glucosidase from Aspergillus, uh, again using tannic acid, is about 15 to 20 percent. Whereas the beta glucosidase in PVCI, it's almost 100 percent. So, what we did, and what many people like to do, is they combine Spezyme and Novozyme, right? That's why it works. I could talk for hours, but I promised Muhammad I wouldn't. So, <laughs> but then again, I might change my mind. Right? <laughs> and, but we had a wonderful lecture, last lecture uh, yesterday from our colleague from Chile. So, they help. So, the enzymes themselves, what happens is inhibitors can significantly inhibit the final step, the beta glucosidase. What then happens is the cell bios builds up, and that will inhibit cell biohydrolase. And cell biohydrolase, the KI, is I think about 10 millimolar, between 1.1 and 1 millimolar, very low level. That in turn will inhibit cellulose hydrolysis. So basically, um, the question is, how much should the enzyme, or could the enzyme cost? And so what we did is we took some work from Professor Harvey Blanche's lab at Berkeley, a colleague of mine, and they did a model on what it cost to, to manufacture enzyme. And then we also had a visiting scholar from Kafka in our lab uh, just this year, and he and I then calculated out different case studies of how much the cellulase enzyme might cost, or should cost, using some of the basic assumptions that have been published, and we found it to be very interesting. So we looked at different cases, 20% uh, pretreated corn stover solids, and again, that's the picture you saw. It's unbelievable, but you start with a wet mass, and by the time you're done pretreating, a small amount of enzyme, it's a liquid. Okay, and we looked at also 5 FPU per gram cellulose, which is about three times higher than what I just showed, and then 10 FPU. So 10 to 20 milligrams per gram cellulose. The results you just saw were for two, one to two. And that's still not economic, by the way. So, so what we did, just, let me just walk through the slide. And this paper was published in Biotech BioEng you know, last year. If we looked at the type of protein, and we look, looked at soybean meal, because that's a very well-defined protein, and we know what the cost is. It doesn't have any enzyme activity, but we said, okay, if it did, this is the least expensive protein one can buy. And then if we said, okay, cellulase itself, according to 
uh, the branches group is probably about $10 a kilogram if you manufacture it on site. Soy protein about a dollar and a quarter. Manufacturing on site about $10 a kilogram. These are the assumptions, and you can put in the different numbers if you want. And then if you look at the uh, FPU of uh, cellulase, this is the number of milligrams based on protein analysis one would see. Okay, this is the protein cost. So then what we looked at was the cost of protein in dollars per gallon for different yields, 52 gallons per ton, 67, 89, and 111, which would be the maximum practical. So if you had a cellulase protein that costs the same as soybean, and somehow converted to cellulose, the cost would range from about 18 cents a gallon to 8 cents a gallon, based on the current enzyme loadings. This is a dollar a kilogram. It doesn't exist for cellulose protein. If you look at these proteins, again, at the maximum conversion, it's still 35 cents a gallon, assuming you get close to 100% yield. And if you use the current standard in the literature, 10 FPU, it's going to be about 70 cents a gallon. There's no way you can make money with it. And so, so it's a very interesting story, and I'll get some, uh, I shouldn't say no way, I'm just a professor, but, you know, it, it will be very challenging. The point is, there's a lot of ways we can improve this by a factor of 10, but we have to be quite analytical and look at the, both the chemistry and the chemical engineering. And your, your lecture is a really very nice introduction to this concept. And of course, if the yields are... 50 cents, uh, 50 gallons per ton, we're looking at $1.50. Or if you had a modest loading, 73 cents. And the previous results you saw, and again, these are very specialized, not that you would build a process, were at about two. So even at two, here, even at two, you'd still be looking at probably about 20 cents a gallon. So the question then is, why is enzyme so expensive? And there's lots of things that go into manufacturing enzyme besides just the microorganisms. And that's a good place to start. Um, the capital cost is about half the cost to manufacture the enzyme. You have waste treatment, utilities. This is an area of fermentation. You have to have compressors. Compressors require electricity. The raw materials themselves, particularly if you use an inducer, can be about a third of the cost. And some of the best uh, cellulase producers will use inducers in order to maximize the activity and protein expression. And of course there's labor and shipping. So the enzyme uh, costs are based on loadings, based on specific activity, how much cellulose can be hydrolyzed per unit weight of protein, the yield that one gets, the cost of production, okay, and really the models are available for calculating enzyme costs, and even if we don't know what it really costs to manufacture enzyme, and manufacturers do not want to discuss this data for very good reason, and you can't blame them, we can estimate what the enzyme must cost if cellulosic ethanol is to be practical. This is a different approach. And then we have to work through that goal of working together as a team. So basically one place to start, and I'm very fortunate, um, Fernanda da Cuna is in, in our lab right now, doing a great job. And this is some of, I guess it's the first time you've seen it, right? <laughs> Oops, I, I, I apologize for that. But these are some, she's been in our lab for about three months, and here's some of the first results she's got. Um, so basically we're looking at a microorganism, uh, different, several different microorganisms, and using sugarcane, the gas that was uh, pre-treated and donated by a, a sugarcane mill in the Sao Paulo area. And then the microorganisms are from the Andropa food, your, your cut sheet, and here's the three that we're using. And this is the newest one. 
but even here she's starting to get some good results. And so here's some pictures of it. Now these are petri dishes. So. So the idea would be is if we take these organisms, which are already acclimated to some of the inhibitors that are present and some of the other environmental factors, can we get something that is a very high activity? And so this is a solid state fermentation result. I, I think some of you have seen this before. We're also looking at submerged fermentation and you can see the pellets forming, which is a little bit of a problem. Um, and we're using enzyme production with 1% uh, weight per volume sugar cane to gas as the, the base case. And this is after 72 hours, which is really quite short for a cellulose production run. And usually they, these fermentations will run five to six days. And, and there's some other things we're optimizing, but she's still learning, but really doing a wonderful job. We're, we're so pleased. Send 10, 10 more, you know, so, okay. And so we, <laughs> uh, so we have a sequential uh, test on sequential solid state and submerged fermentation. So the first step is to not inoculate the spores in the solid material. The second step is we add it to the liquid media. And the third then is uh, producing the enzyme on sugar cane to gas. That's the concept. And the enzyme assays that we're, we've carried out with the resulting enzyme mixtures include endoglucanase, thylonase, you can read them, beta glucosidase, rabinosidase, xylosidase, and galactosidase. And these are all needed in order to hydrolyze either the hemicellulose or cellulose to uh, fermentable sugars. And by the way, you might say, how do we ferment C5 or cellulose or rabinose? There are probably four or five different microorganisms in the world now, or more than that, in Brazil included, that are very effective in uh, converting both five carbon and six carbon sugar to ethanol. And so really that used to be a challenge 20 years ago, but these uh, the, the microorganisms are now available, and the challenge really is getting the sugars inexpensively enough from cellulosic sources to make this work out. So here's the first table First table, I hope this is okay. First table of data comparing the three different organisms and sequential fermentation, submerged fermentation, and solid state. Sequential is solid state followed by submerged. Uh, submerged fermentation is simply inoculate the spores into liquid media, which is a traditional method. And solid state fermentation is growing this on the gas. The idea is to grow the enzymes, and then you would put that material directly into the hydrolysis reactor, no purification. So that's going to be your least expensive option. It does not require compressors or air separately or a mixed tank. And so what you can see is all these organisms are really have very good activity. CMCs, that's viscosity reducing activity, um, C5 hydrolyzing activity, and beta glucosidase activity. The newest microorganism has the lowest titer. But I'm not too concerned about the first time we've tried it, and there's a lot of optimization that needs to be done, including the fermentation time. But what it shows you is these organisms in your collection are very good cellulase producers. More importantly, they're very good producers of, and we didn't do the analysis here, but the top two are very good producers of C5, of hemicellulose hydrolysis activity. And that's critical. Why? If we go back to the aqueous pretreatment, if we minimize fermentation inhibitors, we want to maximize during the pretreatment the formation of oligosaccharides, not sugars. Oligosaccharides inhibit the cellulose. So what we want is very effective enzymes for hydrolyzing the C5 oligosaccharides to monosaccharides in order to minimize inhibition of cellulase. Everybody got that? We'll have a quiz afterward, right? Uh, but anyhow, so, so basically, by considering all these factors together, uh, these uh, microorganisms actually look very interesting. <clears throat> also notice these are aspergillus, they're not um, TVCI, so they're a little bit much easier, I think, to handle. So the enzyme production itself, really, um, so what we found so far, and we're still getting started, is that it uh, reproduces the results you've gotten here. And then 
Uh, higher enzyme production occurs if you do a solid state culture and then you inoculate the matter. Works really well. I'm doing exactly what you asked me to do. Actually, Dr. Freeman sent, sent the student, the organism, the gas, and the instructions. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> makes it really easy for me. That's if I follow instructions, right? Yeah. So, so the next steps are really to optimize the fermentation and then also to test the efficiency of enzyme cocktail, which is very important because of, we're working with the actual gas material and we have all these inhibitors which we don't quite yet understand which ones they are. And so we will have to optimize that. And then we'll compare, uh, we have both TB side and we'll both TB and side and aspergillus in our lab and we'll compare the activities of the two. So what about the toxicity? Well, in, in the case of inhibition, you have a decreased lag phase, decrease in ethanol production rate, uh, can change, it will, will reduce the metabolic yield, which is about 0.5 or so for the yeast. Okay, and then the mechanism of in inhibition and detoxification is really linked to the redox imbalance within the microorganism. So if we can address that, again, again this has to do with both the external chemistry and the type of microorganism we select. We get better yield. Then we have to worry about oxidative damage to cells. And also, if we get the high enough ethanol concentrations, and we haven't had that problem yet, uh, disruption of the ethanol, uh, the membrane by the ethanol. So, in summary, really what I'd like to leave you with is that low cost production processes are possible. But again, to John's point and the speakers yesterday, it will require the uh, application of fundamental science and engineering. I think sometimes when I read literature, many people try things they know how to do, and they learn something. I think what we have to do is understand why these reactions do not work, understand the thermodynamics and the kinetics, and then begin to apply our fundamental chemistry and engineering to one by one address the factors that limit the conversion. So that's what we're trying to do. I think the other thing to take away that I've, I've worked both on acid hydrolysis process, acid pretreatment, alkaline pretreatment, um, ionic fluids. I worked on ionic fluids in 1977. Well, that's, actually, that was, one of, uh, that, that was one of my first publications. I, I guess I'm writing a bit in science. The co-author was Chris, my wife. So, so basically, it's so old it gets reinvented. Just keeps the, the real issue is cost is the key. Environmental compatibility is critical. So you don't want to add all these solvents, these toxic chemicals, if you want, if you can avoid it, because they're very difficult to control at, at large volumes. Okay. And so really, what we want to do is apply the knowledge of this chemistry, then find ways to make our biotechnology work better. So with that, um, thank you again very much. And I really enjoyed uh, visiting with, with you and visiting the university. Uh, professor, thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to ask you about butanol. Uh, I, I've read that butanol is more easily obtainable from cellulosic materials. And it's, uh, it's ready to work with American vehicle engines engineers uh, today without a need for adaptation. So I'd like to ask, uh, what are your thoughts on that subject? Well, that's a very good question, and obviously you study uh, the topic. Uh, butanol is another excellent biofuel. I think, however, people do not recognize that butanol has not been tested or validated as a fuel. And for that matter, cellulose and ethanol still has to be validated as a fuel. So the first thing is, I think this idea of dropping biofuels is perhaps premature. Okay, well let's assume it's validated as a fuel. The next question really is, is what sort of productivity could we expect? And I, I, I listened very carefully to Professor Woodley. And so I think with ethanol, cellulosic ethanol right now, 
70 to 100 grams per liter per three-day fermentation is reasonable. For butanol, this number will be 15, 10 to 15. So the fermenters themselves will be five times larger. Second of all, the butanol is a bacterial fermentation, not yeast. And whereas in Brazil, in the United States, and throughout the world, yeast is really, a, as we heard in a wonderful lecture yesterday morning, yeast is really a very well understood industrial microorganism. And it's one where we can genetically modify it and show that it would not harm the environment. So this is required for regulatory approval. In the case of bacterial fermentation, again, in that butanol, that's another issue that needs to be addressed. So I think there's a lot of potential for butanol, but butanol is probably 20, I'll, I'll, I'll say this because I'll be retired in 20 years, okay? But I think it's, I think it's 20 years behind um, sugarcane ethanol or cellulosic ethanol. But if you're a student just getting started, good place to start your studies, because you can grow with the field. So I have two questions. The first question is, when you did that cost analysis for the ethanol, what process did you use? Was that submerged fermentation? Like when you were talking about enzymes cost, like what was your, what was your like, uh, I guess, I don't know, how, how did you do that? What, was it a submerged fermentation when you did enzyme production? Uh, yes, this would be the traditional uh, develop fermentation for TVCI, and the conditions are given in the paper by Blanche. But the point of the slide is not how you make it, but if you make it at a certain cost, how does this translate into, again, it sounds like Dr. Whitley's like, how does this translate into the cost of the catalyst per unit weight of product that is formed? And so the issue here is that if it costs, if the costs are more than $10 a kilogram, and you use 20 kilograms per metric ton of enzyme, it's not economic. And so the question is, where does one need to be in order to have an economic process? And again, um, this paper was published uh, as a short paper, but very well written by Harvey Blanche, um, and it's in biotechnology, bioengineering uh, last year. Okay, so then my second question is that you've done a lot of uh, pre-treatment or using acid, and other things to get um, from cellulose to sugar content. And I was wondering um, if you have heard of a, a hydrothermal process where uh, you use like subcritical water or um, supercritical water to, because I believe that um, the glucose becomes soluble in water, so then you can use that uh, to create from, it could be a cheaper method. So have you ever done that sort of like instead of just preaching and just increase like the temperature or the pressure? Well, I think Jack, you're referring to the process that was developed by Mike Modell at MIT, probably around 1985, with supercritical, um, with critical or subcritical water. And what happens is the reaction is so fast that it's difficult to control. And so the products that are formed are basically degradation products, polymers. What we use here, and it's very, uh, very well summarized the point of lecture today, what we use here is water where the buffering capacity is brought into the system as a consequence of the high concentration of biomass we use and the ash content and the protein content of that biomass that self-buffers to the right pH range. So you might call this sub, sub, sub critical water pre treatment. Thank you again for the excellent presentation. Uh, I'd like to address uh, quickly three points. Uh, first, uh, you uh, said, uh, by the way, of the C5 fermentation. Uh, I'd like to know your uh, opinion about that because uh, in the industrial scale, the microorganisms that really exist today, we uh, have a set of problems. Either you need micro, very well controlled microaeration if you are using PTM, or you will look to work with GMOs and then you have all the regulatory problems. And well, uh, 
here we are trying to still stick on sacrifices uh, using time. Uh, so I'd like to hear you what you think about that. Uh, the second one uh, is uh, that in Brazil probably most, most certainly, uh, there will be an integration of uh, one, one G and two G. And then uh, the fermentation probably will be in the same parameters and you have the diffusion of those uh, toxic uh, inhibitors. Uh, uh, so the disintegrated concept may, may help uh, somehow to uh, dilute this, thing, this problem. And uh, last but not least, so I think uh, the end further, you think that in situ production of enzymes might be a good uh, trend to, to follow? First one yeah. is start from the wrong <laughs> on, on the C5 fermentations. The organisms I'm referring to are genetic modified. And again, I should say I'm the CTO of Moscone as well. And we have a product now in the corn industry which is genetically modified yeast for a different purpose. And that's going through the regulatory pathway. And this is why, uh, to Jack's question, this is why using yeast is so important, industrial yeast, because these have been used for other purposes, genetically modified. And as long as one obtains the genes that are cloned into these yeasts from known sources and not pathogenic in any sort of criteria, the regulatory pathway, which is very, very strange in the United States, in fact, can be addressed. And similarly with C5, naturally occurring microorganisms, the one I work with is Pipia, and thus require microaeration. But the problem is their fermentation is very slow. Yeah. And so again, you're probably looking at, uh, I think we heard a lecture yesterday about uh, someone using Red Star uh, for some sort of yeast that here from, uh, from Brazil that in fact is modified for visceral reduction setting. And so all these improved strains will in fact be genetically modified. So the answer is yes, but regulatory issues here in Brazil will be uh, very important. Now, the second question was? Uh, the dilution of the... Oh, uh, this the, the, the dilution of the inhibitors. And so by combining the first gen generation, that is the cane ethanol, with the second generation, which is cellulose to conversion, yes, the inhibitors could be diluted. The problem, however, is the inhibition is so strong that one still needs to, except for furfowl, but for the phenolic, still needs to find ways either to minimize them, which will be hard, or to somehow mitigate them. And uh, I think uh, uh, Fernand has worked with one of our other scholars, but for instance, we have just uh, submitted a paper using bioabatement where we use microbial means to oxidize phenolics, works very well. And so there's some other things we could do microbially to reduce that, and then we dilute it, yes. And there's some other benefits to combining that, like keeping the bacterial uh, contamination in control, et cetera. And then the third question? In situ production of cellulose enzyme is what Moscone's product is. So in this case, the concept is we have genetically modified a yeast that will secrete the cellulose enzyme, which will then, in fact, hydrolyze the cellulose directly to glucose. This yeast is also capable of fermenting both C5 and C6 sugars to ethanol. And so yes, it has potential. It's been piloted in the United States. It has potential for sugarcane as well, and it's a long developmental path. But at the same time, I think, uh, short, shorter term, enzymes will still have a very important role to play, if only in liquefaction, for example, that I demonstrated. Thank you, Professor Ladish, for your very, very nice presentation. Uh, but I would like to, to hear from you uh, some comments about uh, the ratio that you have used in this uh, slide, the uh, excerpt that you have shared with us. I'm a little concerned about the the total solids that we we could see in the pretreatment of hard one because uh, thinking about scaling up this process, do you really think that it's 
uh, possible or feasible to find uh, some uh, ways to, to put it on the industrial scale. The total story, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, the total story that I have shown with us is something like 5% in the 95% of water. Is it correct? Um, yes, okay, so the question is how does one scale up yes. a high solids pretreatment from yes. laboratory or power scale to large scale? The machine that you saw is very simple. Um, it was running at 150 grams per liter, 15 percent. The largest scale up um, that can be done in the industry right now, I think, is 33 percent solids. And there are actually very large machines that have been used for many, many years in the pulping industry that, in fact, will enable this to occur. However, these do not look like slurries. As you saw, the corn it looks like a wet material. And so this, uh, this type of machinery, which has been used in the pulping industry, only becomes, uh, only gets a liquid after the first stage and after an enzyme is added. So the key is really to have a liquid when you go into the fermentation step. So in a nutshell, the, the front end uses equipment that's been already developed and tested in the industry for many, many years, but for pulping. And then the back end, using biotechnology, takes this solid mass and makes a liquid out of it so it can be added to the fermenters. So basically, we've tested this um, at Moscone in the pilot plant in, in Rome, New York, and it works very well. I cannot tell you the exact scale, but it's, it's large enough for it to make a plant design. Okay, my colleague has discussed a very limited and pretty high experience that we have with the sugar cane technology standard in this catalog. My, my previous comment is uh, based on some preliminary experience that I have at the Sugarcane Technology Center in Piracicaba with this kind of approach for pretreatment. And I fully agree with you. Uh, we can uh, optimize the pretreatment using this approach. We can, uh, we can see a uh, very, very uh, small amount of uh, inhibitors like uh, uh, acetic acid and uh, furfural and uh, hydroxymethyl furfural. And, uh, but my concern about this approach is basically on the, the energy balance. Because we talking about sugarcane biomass. If you put some amount of in, uh, inside the pretreatment reactor, we need a lot of steam to heat this material and to make the pretreatment. And thinking about scaling up this process, uh, I'm talking about uh, science evolved in this process if it's uh, fantastic. But thinking about scaling up this, I, I, I think I'm not sure if it's feasible. And, uh, so I that, that, that's a very good point, and you are using steam explosion. Yes. And you lose a lot of energy. But in, in this approach, we have used the equipment, not exactly the steam explosion at the end. Right. But we, we have uh, performed just the cooking using the same equipment, but not, not exactly using the de, uh, suddenly re decompressing at the end of the pretreatment, the cooking time. And uh, so, and the. Uh, trying to see the, the, the global picture in this uh, uh, way, I think it's not, uh, uh, not yet uh, feasible to go ahead with this process to the industrial scale. By carrying, you're right, for, for steam explosion, for liquid hot water, which is what Moscone has looked at, uh, and, and some other pretreatments, um, the integration of the heat and the energy is critical to the economics of the process. And so this is where a lot of engineering has been done and needs to be done. And so depending on the biomass material uh, will depend on how you integrate the heat, particularly the heat that is injected. But if you use steam explosion, um, it's very difficult to recover the heat. But even there, if the, if the pretreatment system, if you imagine that that's the highest thermodynamic load, is then integrated with other unit operations that have lower thermodynamic load, you're able to recover the heat and use it, but it's very different from a sugarcane facility. And the other thing is that since you're wor working with the cellulosic material, one needs to recover what is left over, and that then will be burned for generating the heat and the power, which is currently obtained right now from the big gas directly. The reason for that is most of the energy in the gas 
about 80% of it, is in the lignin. And so again, the, the processing of the material to preserve the lignin in the form that can be burned is going to be important. So you're absolutely right, it's the integration, it's the chemical engineering part that will take some of these scientific technologies and translate them from the laboratory to, to sugarcane um, facilities here in Brazil. But I think it's, you're right, it's not ready this week. <laughs> uh, and, and so this is why your work in Rumble is so important to identify the key limiting factors so that engineers here in Brazil and elsewhere here in the Americas, North America, South America, can identify the equipment that already works for other uses that could be integrated into sugarcane facilities. Because without that, the, the capital cost even if you recover it, it would be so high, it's not affordable. And so there's still a lot to be done. And so I think moving systematically, but also in a forthright manner, is going to be important. You mentioned that you, you guys have been using some uh, car activated carbon and also, I think, I exchange at the lab laboratory scale to remove the phenolics and then analyze their effects. And do you think this uh, approach would be feasible for a large scale? We've used ion exchange resin and actually XAD. Uh, these are polymeric disorders, hydrophobic and, and hydrophilic. And it works very, very well, but it's not economic, in, in my opinion. I, I should never say never, but basically, as a professor, I believe. Speaking as a professor now, I don't think it's economic. And so as a consequence, we started looking at other microorganisms, and just like we have in Bracha here in Brazil, we have the ARS, USDA ARS system in the United States, and they're very important partners with Purdue University. And um, there's a professor, a, a, a researcher at the USDA lab that's discovered a microorganism that is able to metabolize the phenolics but not co-metabolize the sugars. So in other words, it, it grows on the phenolics, but does not use up very much sugars. And so we've tried that, and it gives us the same result as overlining. The conversion goes up by 16 to 20%. And I, I can send you a manuscript that's just accepted now in, in a journal. And so what I'm thinking is, if one develops a biotech process as much as possible, if we can avoid add, be very smart and avoid adding chemicals, Use microbiology, biotechnology, even if the genetically modified to remove the inhibitors, will be way ahead of the game. And better yet, if we can start with a microorganism from the Amazon, or from a sugarcane facility that's already been uh, trained to tolerate these inhibitors, and then we would use that to develop the process for genetically modified. That would be very helpful as well.